surprised that this is the way it would be at the end of this system. Notice in his famous Sermon on the Mount, Matthew, the seventh chapter, and we want to look at the 13th and the 14th verse. Notice what Jesus said here. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, and it reads this way. Go in through the narrow gate, because broad and spacious is the road leading off into destruction, and many are the ones going in through it, whereas narrow is the gate and cramped the road leading off into life, and notice, and few are the ones finding it. This is exactly what we see today before us. A few of the world is actually finding this narrow and cramped road that's leading off into life. Well, how about you as an individual? Do you love Jehovah or the world? How important to know for yourself what is actually involved with friendship and agreement with the world. So we might ask, what is friendship with the world? Again, let's go to the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about friendship with the world. Turn, if you will, please, to James. The Bible book of James, we want to consider the fourth chapter and the fourth verse. And it reads this way. Adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world is constituting himself an enemy of God. Now, why would that be true? Because the one choosing to be a friend of the world is choosing to be an enemy of Jehovah God. Remember at 1 John 5.19 where it says, The whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. Well, would you as an individual choose for a friend one whose habits you just absolutely detest? No, you wouldn't. One whose viewpoints are opposed to yours? Well, absolutely not. You wouldn't have a friend that way. Would you take sides with or associate with one of your enemies? No, you wouldn't do that. So taking sides with the world would be doing those things. Now, what do we mean by the world? What actually is the world? The definition that we want to understand is this. The world is the organized human society that exists apart from or outside God's visible organization. So now we wonder about that, God's visible organization. Yes, he does have a visible organization, and from Noah's day we can, we can clearly see this in our mental understanding. Noah and his family, who did Jehovah work through? That family arrangement. That was his organization. He didn't go to other families. And then following that, with Moses, when Moses uh, led the Israelites away from Egypt and the Israelites became his nation, who did Jehovah deal with? That nation of Israel. That was his visible organization. He dealt with them. Later on, in the first century era, who did he deal with? He dealt with those first century Christians. We can obviously see this because when a circumcision arose within that Christian congregation, where did they go? They went to the older men, the Christians in Jerusalem. And then Jehovah dealt with that organization, those first century Christians. The same pattern exists today. What do we have today with his visible organization? We see the faithful and discreet slave, that anointed remnant as represented by the governing body in New York. We see the great crowd that's associated with them. Who is Jehovah dealing with? His visible organization. So anyone who would exist outside of this organization would be in the world, wouldn't they? And that's the way we see it and understand it. So Christians, true Christians, must be separate from this world. Remember what the Bible writer James said at 127? He says, keep oneself without spot from what? From the world. One without spot from the world. 
So as we understand exactly what this world is and we see the various parts of it and the various functions of it, we can see that they're a- in actuality they're opposed to Jehovah God. Now, how do we see that? Well, what is some of the visible parts of Satan's organization? He has an organization too, doesn't he? It certainly does. One of them is false religion. Now, notice how this is brought out in the Bible. If you'll turn to Revelation, the 17th chapter. Revelation 17. And we want to consider verse 5. And upon her forehead was written a name, a mystery. Babylon the great, the mother of the harlots and and of the disgusting things of the earth. Now, if you have the large reference Bible where you see that word mystery, it directs you to a footnote. And there it brings out this point. Mystery, a religious secret sacred to Babylon. Well, how appropriate that false religion is likened to Babylon the Great. Because according to archaeological excavations of ancient Babylon, they found no less than 53 separate and distinct religious temples. So we can see that ancient Babylon was the seat of false religion, worshiping all these different false gods. So how appropriate that we can see that many gods are worshipped today. And so the world empire of false religion, part of Satan's organization, that is opposed to the true God, all follow these various and different gods. Now, another aspect or part of Satan's world and his system of things is political governments. And this is very interesting, too. If you'll turn back to Revelation, the 13th chapter, in verses 1 and 2. Now, before we read this, notice that we're going to be talking about some beast. Now, in the Bible book of Daniel's chapter 4 through 7, it's noted that there's many beasts. And beast in the Bible is symbolic of world governments, political governments. So now notice as we read Revelation 13, 1 and 2, what is taking place here? And it stood still upon the sand of the sea. And I saw a wild beast ascending out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, and upon its horns ten diadems, but upon its heads blasphemous names. Now the wild beast that I saw was like a leopard. But its feet were as those of a bear, and its mouth was as a lion's mouth. And the dragon gave to the beast its power and its throne and great authority. So it's very easy to see that the dragon gave it its authority. Now, what is the dragon? Well, look right back to Revelation chapter 12, and let's read verse 9. So down the great dragon was hurled the original serpent, the one called devil and Satan, who is misleading the entire inhabited earth. He was hurled down to the earth and his angels were hurled down with him. So see, now it's very obvious who gives these political governments their authorities. It's Satan, the devil, the original dragon, dragon, the serpent. So now we can start understanding why we would want to be without spot and not join up or give allegiance to these political governments. This is why it's so important, and I know that we have a natural tendency. We'll see one political dictator on the news. We have a natural tendency to say, oh, what a barbarian. What a nasty individual. I heard a comment one time from an individual says, United States ought to go over there and just bomb them all. Turn that place into a radiation paradise. But see, what are we doing? We're aligning ourselves with the political governments. They both, no matter who does it, receive their power and their authority from Satan the devil, that dragon. So another uh, place here, or another visible part of Satan's system, is found at Revelation 18.11. And if you'll turn there, please. Now we know that Jehovah God is going to put it in the hearts of the governments to bring an end to the world empire of false religion, Babylon the Great. So notice what the commercial system, these merchants, are going to be saying at this time. Revelation 18.11. 
Also, the traveling merchants of the earth are weeping and mourning over her because there is no one to buy their full stock anymore. See, these individuals are upset is because Babylon is gone. Babylon with the great religious spirals and the stained glass windows and the gold and silver statues and the fancy dress and the embroidery and the diamonds and jewels. So the commercial system is upset. Well, we too know that the commercial system is a greedy element of today's society. That's why we have the love canals. That's why we have the hazardous waste dumps and individuals actually sneaking out into streams and waters and dumping pollutants in there. All for the big dollar. They don't really care. And this is part of the commercial system or one of the visible parts of Satan's organization. How important to keep oneself without spot from these elements of this system of things. The world is truly wicked and corrupt. It is opposed to God's righteous laws and is filled with all kinds of immoral practices. We see this today, don't we? We see homosexuality running rampant. We see loose living and immoral ways. And some of us have actually lived in that situation. We've been in the world. So we know exactly that what the Bible describes as being wicked and corrupt, loose living, immoral ways is absolutely the truth. Now notice this. The Apostle Paul highlighted this fact for us in Ephesians. We want to look at the second chapter and the first three verses. Ephesians 2 and the verse 1 starts out this way. Furthermore, it is you, God, made alive, though you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you at one time walked according to the system of things of this world, according to the ruler of the authority of the air, the spirit that now operates in the sons of disobedience. Yes, among them, we all at one time conducted ourselves in harmony with the desires of our flesh, doing the things willed by the flesh and the thoughts And we were naturally children of wrath, even as the rest. So at one time, many Jehovah's Witnesses actually walked this way. And they experienced this corruptible, loose living. So they know what the world has to offer. But now, turn over, if you will, to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And notice the 17th through the 19th verse. This, therefore, I say and bear witness to in the Lord, that you no longer go on walking, just as the nations also walk in the unprofitableness of their minds. While they are in darkness mentally and alienated from the life that belongs to God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the insensibility of their hearts, having come to be past all moral sense, they gave themselves over to loose conduct, to work uncleanness of every sort with greediness. So our admonition here is to no longer go on walking this way, to change our personalities. So we might ask, what do we actually think about when no one else is around? What do we watch in our living rooms? Uh, Do we desire or harbor maybe secret ambitions? that are associated with this world? Do we have that spirit of the world? See, all of these things are very important is because the admonition is that we no no longer go on walking as the nations past all moral sense. It's very important. And in actuality, what can happen is that the bad spirit of this world, if we harbor these inhibitions or these ambitions that are seen in the world, this bad spirit of the world could actually engage us and lead us into practicing them. We've all heard the expression, what you take into your mind is what comes out of your mouth. Well, if we take in these secret ambitions that are associated with worldly things, maybe we're going to start practicing them. So we really truly have to be on guard. And it's very important that we do not love the things associated with the world. 
In fact, we have some very stern, matter-of-fact, plain English counsel on this, that those who practice such things will not inherit God's kingdom. Turn, if you will, please, to the Bible book of Galatians. And notice the fifth chapter and the 21st verse. The preceding verses are talking about the works of the flesh. But beginning with the first sentence of verse 21 in chapter 5, notice what it says. As to these things I am forewarning you, the same way as I did forewarn you, that those who practice such things will not inherit God's kingdom. It's very clear-cut, and it's very plain English. If we practice the things associated with the world, we're not going to inherit the blessings of Jehovah's kingdom. So really, as we stop and think about it, a Christian goals are absolutely separate and distinct from worldly pursuits or worldly goals. Now let's contrast this for a minute. The goals in the world are materialistic. We see that ourselves. We're not living outside the world. We see what the world pursuits are, whereas the Christian goals are spiritual. Worldly people think absolutely nothing of sacrificing right principles in order to further their own selfish interest, even if a personal friend gets hurt in the process. I know that When I began my employment, there was an individual who was uh, also there, and he says, I'll never forget this, he says, I'm going to get to the top, and I don't care who I have to walk over or climb over who or who gets hurt in the process. I'm going to get to the top. Well, the individual is there, but he probably had to hurt a few individuals to get there. But this is, the world thinks nothing of this. The world thinks that everyone should climb the economic ladder of success. And you've heard of this. Oh, you've got to get ahead. You've got to climb to the top. Well, if you want to change things, you have to be at the top to do it. But such thinking fills people's lives with many anxieties and frustrations and hardships. It was recently told to me by an individual says, well, you have to be kind to those who you're walking on as you get to the top is because you have to deal with them as you're coming back down to the bottom. So we don't want to fill our our lives with many anxieties and follow this economic ladder of success. In fact, what did Jesus himself caution us? He said not to be overly anxious about the essentials of life. Remember in that Sermon on the Mount in Matthew the 6th chapter, what did Jesus say? Well, what was going on there at that point? at that time. Remember he said individuals would be saying, what are we to eat? What are we to drink? What are we to put on? And what was Jesus' advice? He says, gaze intently at the birds of the heaven. Jehovah clothes them. He feeds them. He cares for them. How much more so you? And remember the 33rd verse of uh, Matthew chapter 6 where it says, keep seeking first the kingdom, and then all of these things will be given to you. So we can see how important it is to seek the spiritual things, then the necessities of life. They will be, of course, given to us. Now, Jesus also cautioned in another area. He said that the deceptive powers of riches chokes the word. And remember, he was talking about a sower and this sower was sowing seed and he sowed some alongside the roadway. He sowed some in the rocky soil, some in the fine soil, and then it bore fruit. But then where did he sow the other seed? In among the thorns and the weeds and the bushes, and they came up and they choked. Well, that's what Jesus says that the deceptive power of riches do. This happened within the first century itself, among the first century Christians. Open your Bibles, if you will, please, to the Bible book of Philippians. Let's see what Paul's counsel here was. We want to look at Philippians, the third chapter, and we're going to read verses 18 and 19. And notice what it says here. For there are many, I used to mention them often, but now I mention them also with weeping. 
who are walking as the enemies of the torture stake of the Christ. And their finish is destruction, and their God is their belly, and their glory consists in their shame, and they have their minds upon things on the earth. See, what was taking place there at this time was individuals were seeking materialistic things. Their God was their belly, belly and their style of living. And Paul was weeping over these individuals. Why? Because these at one time were brothers. These weren't strangers. These were individuals within that Christian congregation that allowed the deceptive powers of riches to choke that word. And I'm sure that we know of individuals who have actually left the truth over deceptive power of riches, being drawn away and enticed by the world. And this is what Jesus had actually cautioned us against. We know that it's happening today. We know of individuals who have actually had this happen. So we have to be aware of that. We have to be aware of Jesus' caution. Another area that we have to be aware of is uh, what is our attitude towards celebrities and prominent ones of the world? Well, according to the world, these are held in very high esteem by the worldly people. Many consider them as idols and try to imitate them and copy their styles. Their styles include promiscuous conduct, bad speech, habits, and their grooming. And we know of individuals like this, don't we? We see them out on the streets. Um, at one time, uh, had a younger brother, and uh, you could see what kind of figure he was trying to portray. One time, it was the Marlboro Man on television, you know, this cowboy in a little scarf. And then the next time, and it's sort of, um, he's no longer this, and he'd probably uh, get after me if I knew I was talking about him. <laughs> But uh, then one time I saw him and he had this broad-brimmed hat and it was made out of leather, see? And who was that? Clint Eastwood. That's who he was trying, the tough guy, see? Well, we see this uh, in today's society. Individuals wearing uh, crazy sunglasses and trying to look like some of these modern groups. And they do idolize them. And you've seen this. Uh, one time the individual that wore the white glove, see? And how many little uh, uh, mimics were there of this individual? See, idolizing him, screaming after him. Uh, individuals, um, I don't know if I can do this right. What's this guy? He says, born in the USA. Well, <laughs> what happens? Individuals, see, they see this uh, boss and uh, they, they start to channel their lives around him. Oh. And so this is what the world is. But now stop and think, brothers, exactly what we're talking about here. An individual who mimics and follows and patterns their life after these worldly people actually love the world and these individuals more than Jehovah. Why is that true? What was the counsel in 1 Peter 2.21? That Jesus was the model for us to follow in his footsteps. So if we truly love Jehovah, we would be patterning ourselves after the spiritual things, not the worldly things. So where does the love lie of these individuals? Towards the world. We have to be aware of that, and we have to be cautious against it. Also, we know that the world is unloving, it's merciless, and it's unforgiving. Well, within the Christian congregation, could we be unloving? Could we be merciless? And could we be unforgiving towards our fellow brothers and sisters? In fact, one who makes it a practice to belittle or complain and speak slightingly about his brothers is showing that he really loves the world is because he's manifesting that world equality. So the Bible says at Proverbs 16, 27, it says that an individual who does such a thing is actually good for nothing. So we don't want to be good-for-nothing individuals. So it's vital for us to put up a hard fight for the faith. Now, why is this actually necessary? Well, one of the things that the world tries to do is put enough pressure on us to make us succumb to its wishes and its desires. We have to put up a hard fight for the faith is because remember who the God of this system of things is. 
The devil makes the world very alluring. And he tries to turn love for Jehovah to love for the world. Now we get some fine counsel in 1 John about this very matter. 1 John, the second chapter. And we want to consider the 15th through the 17th verse. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not be loving either the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because everything in the world, the desire of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the showy display of one's means of life, does not originate with the Father, but originates with the world. Furthermore, the world is passing away, and so is its desire. But he that does the will of God remains forever. Satan has had thousands of years to know exactly what it takes to cause an individual and want an individual to follow the world's patterns. Sort of like individuals who are great fishermen, they know what type of lure to use to hook that fish. Well, Satan knows this. Satan has an, an alluring world that tries to draw people away. So this is the time right now to build faith, and this is how vital and important it is. What will be our greatest need at the time of the Great Tribulation? Well, it's not going to be the money or the things of the world, is it? No, it's going to be an unbreakable faith that is going to be needed. So now's the time, see, that we have to build that. So how do we build that faith? One of the ways is by persistent prayer. And I heard a sister in this congregation state, if an individual knows how many times he prayed to Jehovah, he's not praying enough. See, so persistent prayer is in all things we need to trust in Jehovah. In all things, we need to lean upon his ways and then he'll make our path straight, see? So persistent prayer is one of the ways that we can uh, build our faith so we'll have that unbreakable faith. Another way is a diligent study of the Bible, to really go out of our way to try to study the Bible and to learn about God's word and what it requires. And then we can build our faith by faithful attendance at the meetings. Now, what does that mean, faithful attendance? Well, there's brothers and sisters that come to the meeting. They're here every time, all five meetings, unless, of course, they are sick or an emergency comes up. That's faithful attendance is because they're taking in this spiritual food. In fact, if you come to the meeting and they're gone, you notice it right away because they, they're here. It's a normal thing to see them. So then you start, well, where is brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so? Faithful attendance at the meeting, it builds our faith. Then to having a zealous share in the field ministry, of course, builds our faith. Why is that? Because when we're talking to others about Jehovah's purposes and intentions for this world, it reaffirms our faith and it keeps our mind on Jehovah and not on these worldly pursuits. Another way that we can resist Satan's pressures is this, a very important way. We are imperfect, so we may succumb to, to Satan's pressure at one time and make a gross mistake. So what do we do? Well, we quit Jehovah's organization. We give up. That is Satan's strategy. He wants an individual who commits a gross mistake to give up. That's his whole plan. But what do we have? Hebrews 13, 17 says, Remember those who are taking the lead among you. We have faithful elders within the congregation who are very loving and merciful and willing to help us if only we would take our problem to them. They're going to provide us with spiritual counsel. And remember what Proverbs 12, 15 says, that the one listening to wise counsel will become stupid. Well, of course not. We'll become wise. And so that's why these elders are within the congregation for us. And it is comforting to know that we can recover from a sinful course. Open your Bibles, if you will, to the Bible book of James, please. And turn to the fifth chapter. And we want to consider the 15th and 16th verse. 
James 5, 15 and 16. And notice what it says here. And the prayer of faith will make the indisposed one well, and Jehovah will raise him up. Also, if he has committed sins, it will be forgiven him. Therefore, openly confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may get healed. A righteous man's supplication when it is at work has much force. So did you notice that point? That our sins can be forgiven us. Well, that's really wonderful. And that's within Jehovah's arrangement. That's within Jehovah's people and his congregation. But isn't it truly comforting to know that Jehovah also will forgive us. In Isaiah, the 55th chapter, in verse 7, let's turn there. Isaiah 55, in verse 7. Let the wicked man leave his way, and the harmful man his thoughts, and let him return to Jehovah, who will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will forgive in a large way. So certainly it is wonderful that we can know that Jehovah God is going to forgive us. Well, we can resist the pressures of the world by another way, too. We can recognize that this world, as we know it, is passing away. So I would ask you, if someone came up to you and they said, uh, i got to pick a nice fancy car, I'll say, uh, a brand new Rolls Royce or a, or a Porsche, they come up and they say, here, I'd like to sign this car over into your name. You'd probably say, oh, goody, goody. But they said there's one stipulation. You have to get in that car and you have to drive it over here to Monarch Pass and drive right off the side. Now, are you going to accept that car under that stipulation? Of course not. So we have to understand that this world is passing away. And we can resist the pressures of this world knowing that if we take these worldly things, we're going to pass away with it. At best, how long is this system of things going to last? Only until the Great Tribulation. And then it's gone. The world is gone. So we have an example of a very faithful individual of the past, and we want to pattern ourselves after him, and that was Moses. Remember what position Moses was in? He was the son of the daughter of Pharaoh. He had all the knowledge of the secrets of Egypt. He had all these material possessions. He could have had everything. But what did he do? He gave all that up. He refused to love those worldly possessions. But he kept strong love for his God, Jehovah. And what was the end result? Moses is assured of a resurrection because of that loyal love that he had for Jehovah God. So this is the type of love that we want to have. We want to have this loyal love towards Jehovah God, and it's going to bring many, many blessings because of it. If we manifest this love for Jehovah, we're going to love his name, aren't we? Now open, if you will, please, to Psalms 119, and let's consider the 132nd verse. Psalm 119 132. And it reads this way. Turn to me and show me favor according to your judicial decision toward those loving your name. So Jehovah will favor those individuals who are loving his name. In fact, if we truly love Jehovah, we will become a people for his name. Remember in Acts, the 15th chapter and 14th verse, where Simeon made this statement. He says that Jehovah, for the first time, turned his attention to the nations to take out of those nations a people for his name. So if we love Jehovah, we will love that name and we will make it known to others. In fact, this was the admonition in Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, where he says, you are my witnesses is the utterance of Jehovah. So how proud we would to be able to take that name to other individuals and to talk about him. Also, those who love God will obey his laws. And we have another fine scripture, 1 John 5, 3, where it says, 
to observe the commandments of God. And yet those commandments are not burdensome. So this is a way that we can show that we love Jehovah God. In fact, if we love him, we would rather suffer persecution than to violate Jehovah's laws. Remember what the apostle said in the first century at Acts 5.29? We must obey God as ruler rather than men. And so we would be willing to do this. If we truly love Jehovah, then we would be guided by his spirit. Now, what do we mean by that? Galatians 5, 22 and 23 talks about the fruitages of the spirit. So if we truly love Jehovah, then we would be manifesting the fruits of the spirit. All nine of them. I recently uh, heard from a brother back in Bethel and he was talking to me about this older brother, Brother uh, Mangus. And he's a Greek brother, and he's one of the anointed, and he's, I believe, 82 or 84 years old. And the bro- uh, Bethel brothers were standing at the bus stop, and here comes this little old brother, and he's on his way out in street service. And he walked up to, to this brother, and he looked at him, and he said, What is this spiritual paradise? So this brother started thinking and wheels started turning. He says, uh, well, he says, that's whenever we, uh, we uh, uh, live by the Holy Spirit. Well, he could tell that that wasn't the answer that this brother wanted. So he went to the other Bethel brothers. And he says, what is a spiritual paradise? So they started firing all these different answers at this brother. And finally he said, you know, the spiritual paradise is whenever the anointed remnant and the members of the great crowd manifest all nine fruitages of the Spirit. He says the world can manifest one of those fruits or two of those fruits, but they never manifest all nine of them. So we want the Spirit of Jehovah. We want to manifest all nine fruitages of God's Spirit, and that's a way that we can truly show that we love Jehovah God. Those who love Jehovah, they love his word, They want to examine it and study it. They want to look into it, meditate upon it. They're eager. They're like those ancient Bereans in Acts the 17th chapter and 11th verse who were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because they eagerly received that word and then they carefully examined it to see that these things were so. That's showing a real love for Jehovah, examining those words. And in fact, it is essential to show him our loving appreciation. If we have a small child, does it that small child, and we've experienced this where, uh, oh, my dad, my dad, he's the greatest dad. He can just do anything. Well, my dad, I know before I was in the truth, my dad can beat up your dad. But a small child wants to express appreciation for their father. Well, we too have a freeness of speech and we can express appreciation for Jehovah. And we want to be like that small child. We want to tell others about Jehovah. My God is great and powerful. My God has all of these purposes for this earth. Look at what my God is going to do. See, we want to be like that child and express our appreciation for a heavenly father, Jehovah. Such love certainly leads to many blessings right now within the congregation. We have brothers, we have sisters, fathers, mothers, we have children, we have an entire congregation and a worldwide association of brothers. And actually that type of blessing is greater for us than even the love that we show towards a fleshly brother or sister that is outside God's visible organization. We love our brothers in the congregation greater than that. That's the blessings that we receive now. But we also have future blessings. We know that Jehovah's word without fail is going to come true. Without fail, Joshua testified to that. Moses testified to that. And one final scripture that we want to end this information on is found at Psalms 145, 19, and 20. And let's share that together. Psalms 145, 19, and 20 reads this way. The desire of those fearing him he will perform. 
and their cry for help he will hear, and he will save them. Jehovah is guarding all those loving him, but all the wicked ones he will annihilate. So, brothers, is your love for Jehovah or the world? Are you going to be saved or are you going to be one of those whom Jehovah annihilates?